The airline industry has never had it tougher. At the height of air travel in 2019, British Airways was operating one of the largest and most modern fleets of aircraft in the world. Systems wise they're extremely complicated. They're probably the pinnacle of human engineering as, as it is at the moment. Before the global pandemic, BA was repositioning itself in an evolving and radically different marketplace. It's a tough world now in aviation, so we need to move on. The competition to attract passengers has never been harder. Going to Narita? Yes. Ah, OK. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. No. It's a pleasure. And the pressure never greater. You know what you're doing? Yeah. You're not going to get flustered now, are you? <laughs> As British Airways enters its second century, pre-COVID, our cameras were allowed exclusive access to every level of this multi-billion pound business. From the men and women who maintain the planes... We're working at height, quite figly, you've got to be careful, especially working, working up there. ..to the people who buy them. Just going to go on, do a general inspection now. From those who fly the fleet... Traffic, traffic to the people there to please the passengers. Oh. Fantastic, isn't it? Coming up, updating its fleet in 2019, BA's top pilots train for the new A350 aircraft. But will they hit the high standards required? Climb, climb, level off. Inside the maintenance center, as a plane is upgraded with Wi-Fi that works in the sky. The ring and the cloud coverage could obscure the signal to the satellite on the ground. Hopefully the Welsh weather doesn't get the better of us. <laughs> Inside the op centre and on the ground with dispatch managers, what does it take to turn a late flight from Delhi into an on-schedule departure to Tokyo? It's a 787 coming in. Uh, unfortunately, it's slightly delayed. <laughs> By 2020, BA's fleet consisted of 250 aircraft, so maintenance was a constant concern. In the UK, one of BA's aircraft maintenance centres is situated here, next to Cardiff Airport. This 455,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility has the capacity to service five aircraft at any one time, from a new paint job to a complete engine overhaul. The Boeing 787 was one of the newest additions to BA's fleet. This one is in for what's called an A-check, a full inspection of all systems. This particular A-check is in the region of 2,000 man-hours. So to put that into context, if you were to do it by yourself, it would take you over six months to do it. Fortunately, Ian has a team of engineers working around the clock, all of them trained in the very latest aviation technology. Systems wise, they're extremely complicated. They're probably the pinnacle of human engineering as, as it is at the moment. We've had this aircraft last Thursday and we've got to get it finished by Friday, so there's always a, a time frame to work to. But the deadline isn't just so the 787 can get back in the air. This particular aircraft is being spruced up as a showcase for a very special visitor. We've got an important visit on Friday. We've got Prince Charles visiting, and uh, this bay's just had a £9 million investment. Um, so that we can maintain multiple types of aircraft in the bay and the visit by Prince Charles is part of the opening ceremony to, to declare the bay open. He came down in 1993 to open the facility, so it'll be interesting to see him coming back. The 787 is scheduled to head back into service immediately after the Prince's visit. But Ian and his team are still awaiting some parts, currently winging their way to Cardiff from America. If they don't arrive before the aircraft's scheduled departure, it means a costly and embarrassing delay. Parts that we're waiting for that are coming to us in a taxi now, the aircraft can't leave until they get here. So we've got to get those parts, get them fitted before the aircraft's serviceable. So there's quite a bit to do between now and when he gets here. I'm not nervous at the moment, but I will be when, when he arrives, I think. But it's not the only threat to Ian's deadline. So we had an incoming defect so with the uh, paint on the top surface of the wing. Um, so we've got a repair scheme for it. Team have put an aluminium coat in on the wing, uh, which we're then going to apply a top coat to so that uh, cosmetically it will look the same as the rest of the wing. Each wing has a skin of carbon fibre. If this is damaged too, it means a lengthy repair and Ian will miss his deadline. So carbon fibre is made up. You've got carbon fibre material, which is basically fabric, and then you mix that with the resin, and it's only the combination of the carbon fibre material and the resin that gives it the strength. 
So when we're inspecting it for damage, specifically what we're looking for is damage to any plies. The aircraft is also having Wi-Fi installed. This latest innovation in air travel is being fitted to all of BA's fleet. Up here is you'll have a transmitter and a receiver antenna, so it's all live time. And you can do exactly as you would be doing in your normal home, on your iPads and phones and everything. The 787-9, which is what this is, comes pre-prepared. So all we do is take our blanking screws and blanks, and it's all ready. All we've got to do is bolt these bits on. Basically, once it's fitted and secured down, it's, it won't move. You know, you can have rain, thunder, lightning, storms. It won't move. It'll sit there on top of the aircraft. In-flight entertainment now is a very big part of any airline. They all want to be better at it than their competitors. They all try from the early days when you could have films that you didn't have the generic film that everyone in the aircraft had to watch, to all of a sudden you could have it on your own screen, you could see what you wanted to watch. And now you can even, with this Wi-Fi, you can download things live and watch them straight away. With brackets bolted to the aircraft's skin, the cradle that will hold the satellite receivers can be lifted into place. We haven't had the cradle in the cage before, so when you Check take it, it up a, little a bit, bit we'll see if it uh, tilts. OK, no worries. Squat slowly. You know where we want him, mate, now? By the tail. By the tail. <laughs> I'll go up and stand up on the where it's going to receive, be received and just give hand signals to the crane driver so he knows exactly where to put it. Yeah? All right. Yeah, just a small amount, though. Clear your side. OK. All right, you hold it there. Next step is to move the antennae themselves. Specially imported from America, these are very valuable pieces of equipment. So, as team leader, Ian is taking responsibility for getting them up to the aircraft. One bump could cost a fortune and lose the team a lot of valuable time and money. They don't want it to swing into the fuselage and damage the fuselage. Coming up, pilots train on the brand new A350 simulator and face potentially dangerous situations. Traffic, traffic, level off, level off. And as pressure mounts to hit the overhaul deadline, engineers reach for the dizzy heights. The biggest challenge is just getting in the right position. It's quite hard to manoeuvre the equipment into those positions and then obviously not overreaching out. When air travel was at its highest in 2019, British Airways had 4,500 pilots on its staff all around the world. It's always been a demanding job with a huge amount of responsibility. Aircraft design has come a long way in a hundred years and the pilot's skills have to keep up with the very latest technology. So, every six months, all BA pilots are sent here. The Sim Hall at Heathrow Airport, home to 16 state-of-the-art aircraft simulators designed to keep pilots on top of the very latest aviation technology and their skills sharp. Ongoing training and assessment takes place every six months for our pilots and they, the whole point is technology is so reliable nowadays that pilots don't get the exposure they may have historically had to dealing with unusual situations. So every six months they, they are brought into the simulators and they are challenged with unusual situations so they can maintain and hone their flying skills. The sim realism is something we absolutely strive for. Without the levels of realism, we don't get the belief from our pilots, so we don't get the most effective training out of them. You will see beads of sweat from the guys. The guys will show real physiological reactions to the fact that they feel like they're in a real aeroplane. But this is no standard training session. These pilots have been specially selected to fly the brand new Airbus A350, due to become the latest member of BA's fleet. Today we're doing part of a conversion course for two of our pilots who are joining the A350 fleet. They're highly experienced A380 pilots and so we are doing a relatively short conversion just to highlight the fundamental differences so that they can fly that aircraft seamlessly and to the best of its advantage. Today is about familiarising ourselves with the A350. Uh, we're all currently rated on the A380 which is a very close cousin to uh, the A350. 
and uh, we're just starting our training plan to bring ourselves from, well, zero pilots at the moment on the 350 to close on 100 by the end of this year. Each of these simulators cost around £10 million and are designed to perfectly emulate almost any situation an aircraft could find itself in. All right, guys, so welcome to your first go at British Airways A350 simulator. What we'll do today to start with is really just start to highlight some of the differences from your previous types. Yeah. Because the majority of this should look very familiar. Yeah, it does. Yeah, and, it does. And effectively, you could operate this aircraft exactly as you operated your previous. Yeah. So the intent of today is to take you on the journey to work out how the ergonomics work to yeah. operate this in an easier fashion. Great, so uh, we are ready for departure. First takeoff in a 350, enjoy it. Take off. V1. Rotate. Just relax for a moment, gentlemen, and I'll pause the sim. Okay. Yeah, very nice takeoff, Mike. Great technique. Excellent first go, so well done, guys. And we'll move on to some of the upper air maneuvers now. Great. Now the challenges for the pilots really begin. The scenario they must face is one of the most dangerous in air travel, traffic avoidance. Right, guys, we're going to start looking at traffic avoidance then. So here's the first scenario. OK, so if you're ready, yep. position freeze is off. Scenario one. Traffic. Traffic. So TCAS blue. Level off. Level off. In 2020, Prince Charles was invited to open a new section at BA's maintenance centre in Cardiff. And this state-of-the-art 787 was the showcase. The team are working against the clock to get all the latest modifications ready. Right now, Wi-Fi antennae are being lifted into place. If the aircraft or the antennae are damaged, the team will miss their deadline. OK, buddy, I'll go um, take it off now, OK? We'll take it off a little bit. Good, yep, yep. No, no, it's Yeah? All right. Yep. So they're just lifting the antennas out now, and uh, they'll drop them in place on, the, on top of the aircraft. OK, these are the actual Wi-Fi antennas that um, do the receiving and transmitting. Uh, that's the real one's the transmitting one, the front one's the receiving one. The actual antenna bits, these, these all, these spin round quite fast. Finally, the hood can be lifted into place. But like most things on an aircraft, even that has some special modifications. These lines here, the gold-coloured lines, they're actually uh, metallic strips. And if you get lightning strikes and things like that, they'll, they'll carry them. And what you have on each of the end of these, they have a different bolt that's more conductive. They'll transmit to connections. They'll take it all to discharge wicks and things like that. Once the antennae are wired in, the hood can be fixed into position. The Wi-Fi needs to be in line of sight with the satellite, so it will be combined with an outdoor engine test later on. Meanwhile, at the far end of the aircraft, there's a problem with the light that illuminates on the tail fin. The recent hangar refit means technicians can be freer to work around any part of the plane, but it does require a head for heights. Uh, when the aircraft came in, it came in with an issue with its logo light, so we're going to go up now, investigate the issue, and replace the ballast and the igniter on the assembly. The biggest challenge is just getting in the right position. It's quite hard to manoeuvre the equipment into those positions and then obviously not overreaching out. I don't mind heights. It's, it's OK for me. Some people don't like it, but you get used to it. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So am I right to come through? Yeah, crack on. Thank you. The Prince is also going to be inspecting inside the plane, so customer effectiveness executive Juliet Montague wants to make sure everything is perfect. We have got a very special visit. His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales um, is coming to learn a bit more about um, some of our sustainability initiatives on board. Um, so obviously my part of that is to take him through the aircraft and show him some of the things we're looking at doing throughout the year and beyond to remove single-use plastic and just be more sustainable in general. But first of all, Juliet has to get the seating displays just right. Well, you think you know exactly how it should look until you think, actually, I've never looked at which way the pillow should go. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, it's just to try and double-check to make sure it looks exactly how it, sh how it should be. 
Back in the hangar, mechanic Kate finishes the light replacement on the logo. Yeah, it went well, really well. We tested it, we needed to replace the lamp, so we're just about to do that now. Once we do that, we can test it again and hopefully everything will be fine. It's quite a confined space to work in. There's a lot of things in the little space. And we're working at height quite figly. You've got to be careful, especially working, working up there. The Prince is especially interested in sustainability and the environment. The 787 he'll be inspecting is one of the most fuel-efficient aircraft in BA's fleet. So this is Rolls-Royce Trent Thousand that's fitted to the 787s. It's a high bypass uh, fan engine. So what that means is that there's 90% of the air goes through the fan and 10% of the air goes through the core. So there's 10% hot, 90% cold air. And that makes it more fuel efficient and it also makes it a lot quieter. Just for context, the 747 bypass ratio is about 70-30. Uh, the treble seven is about 80-20, so you can see as the, as the newer engines come out, they go for a higher bypass ratio on the engine. So this is the back of the engine. This is what we call the cold stream. So you've got cold air coming this way, coming out of the back of the engine. And then this really small bit here on the exhaust, this is where the hot air comes out. So as you can see, there's a massive difference between the amount of cold air coming out and the amount of hot air coming out. When an aircraft takes off, the engine noise that you hear, the roar you hear, is the cold and the hot air mixing, and the screaming noise you hear is all the rotating parts inside the engine. So because this has got a massive cushion of cold air around the hot air, this is why these are a lot quieter than the older type engines. One of the other benefits of having a high bypass, apart from the noise, is it, uh, it's a lot more fuel efficient, which is obviously the big driver for aviation these days. It's all about fuel efficiency. And in the cabin, Juliet's worked out a way to show off BA's new sustainability initiatives. We're going to dress a lot of the plane. The plan is to, on either side of the aisle, show a bit of what is current or previous. And then on the other side, we'll be showing something uh, that's more sustainable or something that we're looking towards in the future. So we've got lots of plans for this year. So we're kind of trying to showcase them all. Each change has a massive impact just because we're such a huge global operation. Simply just looking at the changing of the way we wrap all our bedding across all the cabins, changing plastic into sort of paper bands or another alternative. It is big, it's not a drop in the ocean. She may have her patter for the prints worked out, but Juliet still has a lot of work to do. They look so much better. We're going to have to iron all of them. <laughs> To achieve perfection, sometimes you've just got to do things yourself. The glamour. In 1925, an RAF officer made a forced landing on Heathland, just outside West London. He noted how flat and even the ground was, perfect for a runway. In the 1920s, Imperial Airways, later to become British Airways, flew its first flights from a newly built small airport known as Heathrow. Since then, company and airport have grown together in size and fame. In the 1950s, the arrival of the Jet Age, an aircraft like the Hawker Sidley Trident, carrying an unprecedented 115 passengers, led to a huge explosion in international travel and with it, some massive logistical challenges. So what exactly did it take 60 years ago to get an aircraft turned around and ready to fly again? The Trident came into service in BEA in 1964, but it was not until 1966 that I came face to face with the aircraft and got involved in organising its ground handling. Now, in the 60s, when we were all introducing jets, the speed of aircraft was obviously going up, and therefore it was very important to keep ground time to a minimum. Aircraft spent more of their time on the ground than they did in the air, and we had to do something about it. Now, turning an aircraft round is a very complicated exercise. It requires tremendous coordination to achieve a minimum turnaround of 30 minutes. There were, for example, in that 30 minutes, the need for upwards of 20 vehicles to, to visit the aircraft. I suppose in all there must have been over 50 people or more whose activities needed to be timed to almost a split second. It then became standard practice for us to establish minimum turnaround times for every aircraft. And I think these tighter 
procedures and better coordination, these routines that we developed in the early 60s began to pay off in the 70s, and I think we really could call ourselves number one in Europe. Number one in Europe. Fast forward to 2019, and Heathrow had become the second busiest airport in the world for passenger traffic, with over 90 million passengers a year. The airport's turnaround operation is managed from the Ops Centre, which then passes the information on to one of BA's 200 aircraft dispatch managers. It's a key role that Sally Ann Ellis has held for over 32 years. It's very important for our aircraft to get away on time, in particular short tour services. We run a very, very tight schedule and losing a few minutes here and there throughout the day has a knock-on effect. The next service will then potentially be delayed. And today, the pressure is on. This flight from Delhi has arrived 30 minutes late. Now sally Ann has just a few hours to turn it round for a flight to Tokyo. And her first task is to get the air bridge into position. Our aim is to get these uh, jetties on within a couple of minutes to get people off, especially if this one's late. It's quite a long drive. So we always leave a little bit of a gap in case the aircraft moves and the jetty comes near the door. So uh, knock on the door so they know that we're here and give them the thumbs up. Hello, how are you? Now the cargo and baggage can be unloaded. With the passengers disembarking, Sally Ann can begin preparing the plane for its next flight. So what's going to happen next? Hopefully the cleaners will, will arrive. As you can see, it's been a nine hour flight and uh, it does need a bit of spring cleaning, I think, really. It was an overnight flight, hence all the pillows, blankets all over the place. We have left to go now, um, one hour fifty. We have cleaners and on the other side we have caterers. And we have caterers here at the middle door as well. Already cargo is being dropped at the rear of the aircraft. This is cargo for the outbound flight. With just under two hours to go, 5,000 kilos of cargo, including 3,700 kilos of luggage and a consignment of fresh flowers, can be loaded. With loading underway, Sally Ann needs to ensure she has all of the 230 meals needed for the flight. The catering company deliver the meals directly to the aircraft. These have got seals on, but it'll have. Just seeing if it's got the flight number on it. I mean, I know it's been done. Yes, it has. Right, now that flight number's there. I'm happy now that the caterers have been on. You can see here we've got catering, if I can open up. Catering here. This all looks very fresh. Next on the list, check that the aircraft is clean enough for new passengers. This looks as if it's kind of ready to go. Looks good. It's all clean and it's all catered. So um, that's good. That's very good. So it's all wait waiting for crew and passengers. But although she's happy with the plane on the inside, on the outside, sally Ann still has a lot to do and only an hour left to do it. I'm going to go down to our little pod downstairs. I'm going to prep the flight, print a load sheet out for the captain, um, hopefully catch up with the loading team, and hopefully we should have some cabin crew. Coming up, inside the cockpit simulator of BA's brand new aircraft. We're going to carry out a traffic collision avoidance manoeuvre to highlight effectively the differences for this aircraft. And at the maintenance centre, Ian fires up the engines to run a systems check on his newly serviced plane. Can I start number one engine? Right, OK, starting number one. Aircraft have developed almost beyond recognition since the first passenger flights in the 1920s. From drafty, uncomfortable metal boxes to the computer-controlled digital wonders of today, British Airways has also had to work hard to make sure its pilots maintain the highest standards and awareness of technology. Many of BA's first jet pilots had been trained in the Second World War, 
But as time went on, it became necessary for BA to train more and more pilots from scratch. A special training college was established at Hamble on the south coast of England. It started here, the College of Air Training. Getting in wasn't easy. Of all those who apply, only about one in ten is lucky enough to come here for 18 months training. Pilots underwent concentration, intelligence and reaction tests before being allowed to start training on small single-engine aircraft. Single engine with a propeller at the front and two seats behind. Not exactly a VC-10, but ideal for a beginner. When the instructor was happy, pilots were allowed to fly solo. I remember last time you, you were ever correcting, your speeds were erratic and you weren't lined up on the landing run at all. Do this two or three times and you begin to wonder whether you'll ever make a pilot. Pilots gradually moved up to twin-engine aircraft before qualifying. In the 1930s, simulators were introduced, allowing pilots to get the feel of flying large passenger aircraft without the expense or risk. The red light and the bell tell you that an engine's on fire. Up front, the simulator is exactly like a real aeroplane. It's only behind where the passengers normally sit that it looks different. It will do the takeoff briefing now. Uh, engineer, captain. But once you're in the pilot's seat, you forget it's just an elaborate box firmly fixed to the ground. Take over the bottles at V1. That's a wet runway, so we'll have igniters on and engine anti-icing. But nowadays, technology has developed to such an extent that pilots do almost all of their training on these 10 million pound simulators. These pilots are updating their skills in preparation to fly the brand new Airbus A350. We're going to carry out a traffic collision avoidance manoeuvre to highlight effectively the differences for this aircraft. Older traditional aircraft will indicate the problem to the pilot, but the pilot has to manoeuvre manually. This aircraft will actually carry out the whole manoeuvre for us. So as you'll see, guys, you've got intruder aircraft yeah, coming in. Catch traffic on the uh, Oh, yeah, here on the ND. Here, these little diamonds represent other aircraft. And they show your relative altitude. So that traffic, traffic. So the aircraft's just coming into view. Climb. In the water Climb. Now. So TCAS. Speedbird 350, roger, report and clear of conflict. Clear of conflict. Working with the new A350 systems, the pilots have successfully ordered the autopilot to steer the aircraft away from a potentially dangerous situation. It's very close to what I'm used to, the A380, but it's great to see all the extra little features and evolutions that have taken place uh, in the design of this aircraft. For any professional pilot to be involved with a new aircraft being introduced to the airline is, is a privilege. It's personally a, a challenge that everyone wants to, to meet. So our two guys today, they've been through a fairly rigorous assessment and training process, the two combined. And effectively from here there will be continual training at this point to get them ready to bring forward the first aircraft. We will continue to see them in the simulators for their regular checking and testing. At the BA Maintenance Centre in Cardiff, the team are working around the clock to get this new 787 ready for a visit from Prince Charles. OK, so it's uh, 8 o'clock Thursday morning. It's the day before the Prince arrives. Um, so really this is the last day of the check because we need everything finished tomorrow for the visit. Um, so this morning we're fitting the leading edge on the horizontal stabiliser and then we start to de-dock it in the next hour or so and we'll get out for ground runs about 10 o'clock this morning. The aircraft will need to be towed out of the hangar for the engine test, but there are still a few jobs to do first. The leading edge of the horizontal stabiliser was previously removed and taken to a workshop for repair. There's about 300 holes to drill off, so it's, 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 quite, uh, it's quite involved. But it's now back in position and can be secured to the stabiliser. Replacing some paint on the wing, Ian's team had to take special care not to damage the carbon fibre skin underneath. But it's all gone smoothly and the job is almost complete. They're just putting the, uh, the final coat of paint on now, which is basically the colour. Um, so the top upper surface of the wing and the fuselage on the 7-8 uh, 
and the treble seven uh, is brilliant white. So it will probably need a couple of coats. There's different colours on the leading and edges. The upper wing surface, the lower wing surface is silver. So there are different colours all over the aircraft. I am relieved that we've managed to fix it because ultimately it would have meant we would have had to defer the defect to a later date or potentially add days to the, to the check and keep the aircraft longer. So uh, we're looking good for the ground runs now. With a few final touches, the paint job is finished and by 10 a.m. the aircraft is finally ready for its engine test. Right, so 10 o'clock, we'll push the aircraft out, we'll start the auxiliary power unit. Uh, that gives us power to supply all the aircraft systems. Halfway out, we'll do our dry spins, which allows us to leak check the um, filters and everything that we've disturbed on the check. The other thing we've got to do outside is the Wi-Fi, connect the Wi-Fi for the first time. So there'll be some testing going on on that before it comes back in as well. The engines of a 787 can generate enormous power, even on the ground, so safety is crucial. The engines on this aircraft produce in the region of about 70,000 pounds thrust each. On the ground, we won't use full power, we'll only use about 50% power during the ground run. If we didn't have the chocks and the brakes on it, we'd still taxi quite at a high speed. Well, we're pushing back now, we're just going to get the doors open. We're a little bit later than anticipated, but apart from that, it's gone pretty well so far. So we need to get it out in the rain and get it run. So as you can see, it takes quite a few guys to move the aircraft out to keep it safe and make sure we keep an eye on the wings and everything. Time for the dry spin, where the engines are cranked without fuel to check the systems and filters haven't been disturbed during general maintenance. With everything running OK, it's time to head outside for full ignition. Yep. Ensure five gear pins fitted. Pins in there. Nose gear centred, steering pin removed and stowed. Ensure engine intakes are clear of debris. Engine cowl is closed and secured. Install chocks. OK, ensure apron run pren is clear. For this test, we only need to run the engines at idle power for five minutes. Um, so all that's going to do is make sure that all the, all the oil temperatures come up, all the oil pressures come up, so we can do a more comprehensive leak check over and above the one we've done. We're going to run the engines. We can fully power the aeroplane up. So we're not just looking for any uh, engine-related messages. We we're looking to clear all the messages so we know that it's a good aeroplane for departure. Can I start number one engine? Right, OK. Starting number one. Starch, the right, so we're looking for positive oil pressure uh, before we put fuel in. So oil pressure's climbing, auto start engaged, looking for fuel. If you've got fuel flow, keep an eye on EGT, N2 coming up to 50%. Yeah, cut. Starter. Yeah, starter cut out, confirm. Confirm, engine running. All our figures are good. So we just got, there's a timer on the, on the aircraft, so we just, we'll time that and that, how long we've run in the engines for. We've got to run them for a minimum of five minutes to satisfy the test. In the aircraft cabin, technicians are preparing to test the Wi-Fi system. The rain camp and the cloud coverage could obscure the signal to the satellite on the ground. But Hopefully the Welsh weather doesn't get the better of us. <laughs> so normally this is the quick path, but it could be the rain. It's saying no satellite link. It's connecting. So we've got receive, just waiting for the transmit. Fully locked on to the uh, network. We don't have any ground contact at all. So the antenna is above on the fuselage. And basically it, it, it transmits a message to the satellite, the satellite will pick that up and relay it to whatever ground base they, they have and uh, it sends back the reply to the aircraft from the same satellite. And we've got a closed link, so we're fully internet capable now. And that's, that's it. Yeah, yeah, well, that'll be stress levels come down. <laughs> <laughs> and there we are, the page is loading. And that's what the customer will see on the internet. 36,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Ian, we're all done. All uh, the internet's all completed, and uh, yeah, we've got connectivity. All right, cool. Thank you. Cheers. It's good news across the board for Ian. Runs are all good. The Wi-Fi testing's all good. So we need to get it back in now and make a start on the um, software loads. So that's the next uh, the next big job to do. Well, the last big job, really. The software load will update and check all systems on the aircraft. It could take anything up to 24 hours. Next morning, it's the day of the royal visit. Juliet and her team are able to get back into the aircraft to do their final checks. So I'll be meeting His Royal Highness here, which is the Doors 1. Uh, so if you'd like to go on, have a look. So we'll be taking you through our first class cabin and showing a bit of information about some of our new bedding products that are made out of recycled bottles. We'll move finally into World Traveller cabin, where we've got a few um, items set up, which are kind of the more food and drink service items. So we've got one paper cup here, which is just something we're hoping to trial. It's got a plant-based coating, so it's um, fully recyclable with all your normal paper. Uh, it's biodegradable. So moving on to uh, cutlery, it's quite a hot topic at the moment. Um, it, cutlery, plastic cutlery will be banned eventually under the EU legislation. I've kind of brought along a couple of the hundreds of samples I have in the office, pressed cardboard. And you wouldn't think that cardboard would be sturdy enough to eat your dinner with, but um, I ate a chicken breast the other day quite successfully. The great thing about this, it's actually made from industry byproduct, so we're not even using material that could have been used for something else. It's something that was going to be discarded anyway. And then obviously we'd be looking at wrapping it in something else, so this is one of the potential solutions we might look at, just having it wrapped in a really simple paper wrap. Uh, I really hope people like all this. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of thought that goes into it, a lot of work. This is just the beginning almost of the, sort of the research of some of the things that we'll aim to implement by the end of the year. It's now just a few hours until the visit. The aircraft interior is given a final spruce up, but there's still a problem hanging over Ian and his team. Still got a couple of jobs to finish off on the aircraft. Uh, we've got parts coming to us now on the M4 as we speak in a taxi, um, but obviously fitting those, we've got to schedule those around the visit. The aircraft can't fly without them. Coming up, with just an hour before the scheduled Tokyo departure, Sally Ann's down to the wire. I am looking to see if we have a slot. I'm looking to see how many flight crew we have. And at the maintenance centre, a delayed part could put a spanner in the works for Ian and his team. We're skin of our teeth now, we're just going to get these on. There you go, fellas. At Heathrow, aircraft dispatch manager Sally Ann Ellis has just one hour to finish turning a delayed flight from Delhi into an on-time departure to Tokyo. I am looking to see if we have a slot. I'm looking to see how many flight crew we have. Next on her list is to make sure there's enough fuel on board for its 6,000-mile trip. 67 tonnes of fuel this is going to take, so a fair amount. We're almost full. I think we've got two empty seats left at the moment. Um, that's about it, really. So I'm going to go upstairs. I'll see the fueler first. Um, I should go upstairs, check with the cabin crew, because we want to start boarding in about six minutes. So let's go. Hello. 67, please. Do you want that? Might as well, just in case. OK, all right. Sally Ann heads to the departure gate to check that the passengers have started to come through. Boarding is underway. We did start on time, 44 minutes before departure. So it's looking good. But with just minutes to go until the gate closes, there are still some passengers missing. Going to Narita? Yeah, oh, OK. Do you want to come straight round here? Please, that's great. They've just got married. They're going on a month holiday, including cruises and going to Japan and Russia. So it's nice to see you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Right, that's that. Let's get this off. And finally, after one last visual inspection, flight BA5 to Tokyo leaves the gate right on schedule. I see one push back and it's on time and it has been a good team effort. We, that 
aircraft, I think, has two empty seats on it. We've got 214 people on there. The holds are full. Everyone's done a smashing job, and you can't ask more for that than that, really, can you? So, uh, good day. Good day. Fantastic, isn't it? Really is. At BA's Aircraft Maintenance Centre in Cardiff, the team are preparing for a visit from His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. The Prince will be inspecting this state-of-the-art 787, one of the most environmentally friendly aircraft in existence. But Chief Engineer Ian is still waiting for a final part to be delivered before it can fly back to London. So it is... Uh, 20 past 12 now, so we should be here in the next 20 or 30 minutes, I'm guessing. I'm starting to get a bit nervous now, I've got to be honest, so yeah, yeah. The rest of the staff are in position, flags at the ready. Yeah, I am excited, a bit nervous now, the, the time is coming closer. I have to do a little dip, bounce, and uh, obviously mind my P's and Q's and call them soon. With minutes to spare, the aircraft's missing part finally arrives. Oh, Rich, oh, awesome. Uh, you know, the onions are Pete Clumps, you're waiting for. Thanks, mate. All oh, right, delivery. excellent. I'll take him over to Max now. Cheers, mate. We're skin of our teeth now. We're just going to get these on in time and get this closed up. They've flown over from Miami yesterday. They cleared customs, and then they've come down by taxi to this morning, straight to us, so let's get them going. There you go, fellas. You all right, Jay? Yeah. You're not going to get flustered now, are you? <laughs> no pressure, fella. Because you've made it here, it might be slightly yeah, oversized. Yeah, you can see it's sort of going in and yeah, it's patting on the bottom. Yeah, okay. So we're just doing it up and uh, it's good to go. And not long after, the special guest arrives. The Prince is shown around all departments and takes special interest in Juliet's sustainability initiatives. Can be creative for something to use the time time again. Uh, we also at the same time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad indeed to have this brief opportunity of joining you today, 26 years after I came and opened it originally. If I may say so, as somebody who occasionally flies in, in British Airways aircraft, uh, I'm enormously impressed by the work you all do here, and I can imagine just how much skill and ingenuity and effort and devotion go into maintaining these aircraft. I can't quite believe you need another plaque, because I think you had one from the last occasion. <laughs> but nevertheless, I think you give me greater pleasure to unveil another plaque for you all here. It went really well. Um, I think it was genuinely really interested in hearing um, about exactly what it was that we were trying to achieve. Uh, really impressed with the things we've already implemented throughout the last year. Oh, it was amazing. It was really friendly. It was a really pleasant visit. It wasn't, um, it wasn't as stressful as I thought it was going to be, actually. It was really easy. And the great thing was he spoke to quite a lot of people while he was here as he was walking around. So I think a lot of people got the opportunity to speak to him, which is really nice. I think it went well. Yeah, I was very nervous, but it was definitely an experience, definitely one to remember. As for the 787, it can now be prepared for its journey to Heathrow, ready for full service. We're doing the final uh, system checks after the software load, and then we're getting it de-docked, ready to get it pushed out in the next couple of hours. I mean, we've still got the stuff to do, so yeah, we need to crack on, really. Next time, engineers race against the clock to completely refurbish an aircraft's interior. Very complex, some new procedures, uh, new processes. Um, it's going to be good. BA prepares to take delivery of a brand new aircraft, but will it hit their high standards? If it falls below that, then we will reject it. And the night shift burn the midnight oil to get everything ready for the morning service. If there is a failed test, there's a chance that we may not deliver for the morning flight.